A theme I find myself returning to over and over is that of textual survival. What survives from history and what doesn't? And what do those survivals reveal and conceal to us about history? What survives might be representative of the past, and it might just, well, be an accident. And our bias toward those survivals can actually greatly distort our understanding of actual history, literature, and community. Of course, we can also endlessly contemplate what has been lost. Untold volumes perishing a multitude of deaths, voices lost forever. We can also be hopeful that untold caches lay underground or that new technologies will unlock the carbonized library at the Philosopher at Herculaneum. Though miraculous, survival is still a rather meager existence, often resigned to the intellectual custody of academics, pepperologists, and specialists with little to no impact on the wider world. What is truly amazing, really a miracle atop a miracle, is when a text otherwise lost for centuries of oblivion not only survives what Hegel calls the slaughter bench of history, but is positively reborn into the active lives of contemporary communities. An amazing example of such a survival, a survival in a single manuscript no less, along with a contemporary rebirth, is that of a complex incantation grouped among the Greek magical papyri known as PGM-5, lines 96 through 172, or in antiquity as the Steli of Jehu, the hieroglyphist in his letter, but now reborn, interestingly enough, in contemporary occultism as the bornless ritual. In this episode, I want to explore this ancient text and trace its developments as a core contemporary occult ritual as developed by Aleister Crowley, first in the Lesser Key of Solomon, but most maturely in his ritual masterpiece, the Liber Samech. If you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, alchemy, Kabbalah, or the history of the occult, make sure to subscribe here to Esoterica and make sure to check out my other content on esotericism, including curated playlists on various topics. Also, if you want to support this work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics in esotericism here on YouTube for free, I'd hope you consider supporting my work by checking out my Patreon with a one-time donation or with the Super Thanks option. You can also buy a shirt or something over at our merch store. You can see the store tab on our channel. Also, I'd like to extend a very special thanks to Marco Visconti for reading the script of this episode and for his upcoming book, The Aleister Crowley Manual. If you haven't had the chance to check that out, you might want to pre-order it if you're interested in Aleister Crowley. But now let's turn to the survival and rebirth of this incantation to the Akephalos, the headless divinity and its rebirth and transformation as the bornless ritual and Liber Samech. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. The Steli of Jehu, the hieroglyphist in his letter, survives in a single manuscript and is grouped in a vast array of texts scholars now refer to as the Greek Magic Papyri, a rather heterogeneous collection spanning genres, languages, centuries, cultures, but sharing their development and survival in Hellenistic and Roman Egypt. I have a whole episode on the Greek Magical Papyri you can check out if you want an introduction to that material. The text in question, however, is a circa- 4th century collection of magical texts, actually oddly sandwiched between two texts for detecting for detecting thieves. Probably this is an ancient interpolation in the copying process. Indeed, to be honest, the text itself is rather shabbily prepared with various common scribal mistakes, with its uncial hand far from professional, such that actually an early editor referred to it as being rather coarse and irregular. The collection itself has rather mysterious origins, as befitting it. It re-enters history in the hands of the merchant, adventurer, antiquarian, and every shady NPC you've ever bought sketch magic stuff from in RPGs 
His name was Giovanni Anastasi and during his tenure from 1828 to 1857, serving as the Swedish Norwegian consul in Egypt, he came into possession of a vast collection of Egyptian antiquities, including a collection of ancient papyri, probably originating in the area of Thebes, probably the result of tomb raiding. Sketch and sus, I told you. Of course, vast collections sold to museums and auctioned away. One of those that he sold was to the British Museum, and it entered its collection on the 30th of October, 1839, right around Halloween, because of course it did, including what would now become British Papyrus 46, which contains the steli along with a bunch of other spells like Detecting Thieves and some Ring of Hermes spell. Ring of Hermes spell. It would first receive a modern edition in Charles Wycliffe Goldwyn's 1852 fragment of a Greco-Egyptian work upon magic before being properly republished in the famed Egyptologist's book E.A. Wallace Budge's 1899 volume on Egyptian magic. Everybody seems to have a copy of Budge's Book of the Dead, which is not reliable. Of course, that volume would reappear during the period of British Egyptomania, an enthusiasm that was felt deeply into the occultism of the period. Come back to that, and as we'll see, the Stella of Jiu in the hieroglyphus in his letter would be propelled to occult stardom and frankly remains a deeply revered ritual in contemporary magic, that is magic with a K. Before turning to its occult revival, let's take a look at the complex incantation itself. The steli is composed in Greek, and that does appear to be the original language of the composition, though some of the magical words, as we'll see in a moment, have their origins in Egyptian and in Hebrew, respectively. The text itself seems to be composed of at least three distinct sections. Actually, maybe several older spells stitched together that originally had very little to do with one another. I lean in that direction. There's an opening invocation, an exorcism, a divine identity section, and finally a practical section for the preparation and execution of the spell overall. Again, depending on how you carve this thing up. Like many spells in the Greek magical papyri, it betrays a significant and fascinating degree of cultural and religious syncretism. The title of the text is already super interesting in itself. The Steli of Jiu, the hieroglyphicist, and his letter indicates that the text as we have it conceives of itself as being carved into a stone monument. This is a motif known from other magical texts such as the Tablets of Stone or the Luchot of Moses, or the Steles of Turquoise and Hieroglyphic Characters as discussed in the Hermetic Discourse of the 8th and 9th found in Nagamati 6, or the famed Emerald Tablet of Hermes Trismegistus. So it fits comfortably within the idea that this is some magical thing to be written upon a stone. Further, the name Jiu is actually significant in the history of Gnosticism. In both the Bruce and Askew Codices, the entity of Jiu plays a central role in both the Pistis Sophia and, appropriately, in the two books of Jiu. In those texts, we find a distinct Gnostic mythology in which an entity known as Jiu is said to be the true God and the father of Jesus' father. The father of Jesus' father, who acts as the prime emanator of being from within, the, within this area called the treasury of light, producing both the aeons, but also the archons. This is a distinct difference from other malevolent demiurgic traditions like the one found in the Apocryphon John. This Jehuic tradition and the Bruce and Askew Codices is something I'll be certain to loop back to in future episodes. But you can check out Evans's book, The Books of Jew and the Pistis Sophia as Handbooks to Eternity. That is a fine study of that tradition if you want to dive deep into that material. But yeah, it's published by Brill, so you'll need to sell one of your kidneys to buy it. But hey, you know, what's a kidney compared to Gnosis anyway, right? You see, Brill, you see what you drive people to do? They're selling their body parts in the black markets to get your books. Now, if the Jiu of the Steli of the Jiu of the Gnostic text is the same character, isn't totally clear, but the name seems conspicuous nonetheless. Regardless, the first section invokes a downright mysterious deity simply known as a Kephalos, or the Headless One. Quite simply, we know very little about this being. 
It appears to be associated perhaps with Osiris, which makes some sense, both here and in PGM3, and it seems to actually be pictured at around line 170, there with various magical names and vowels well attested in other spells, including a cool Christian spell that actually indicates that similar vowels are actually tattooed on the chest of God. I love this stuff. In a dream oracle text connected with the popular Praetor Egyptian god Bess, the Akephalos is invoked starting at PGM 7, line 234, where burial, dying, and rising imagery are associated with it, hence that connection possibly to Osiris, along with what is apparently control over fate or necessity, this is a perennial concern of the era, along with a persistent call for the use of rainwater in its rituals, which is interesting. It mentions rainwater frequently with the Akephalos. Another dream oracle spell associated with Bess again also appears at PGM 895 and following and at PGM 102 line 5 and following with the invocation being very similar to that of PGM 7. It's possible that this being even appears as late as the Testament of Solomon. So check out my episode on the Testament of Solomon if you're more interested in that. Though, frankly, we know very little about this divinity, despite a dozen or so attestations in the Greek magic papyri, it's simply little attested elsewhere. And what headless deities do appear, it's not even clear if they're even connected to this divinity. Like all mysterious, powerful, and poorly attested beings, academics and occultists have attempted numerous identification of this being with little in the way of success, in my opinion, and frankly, barring some future discovery, I will only forward that the Akephalos will remain more celebrated, perhaps even more invoked, than understood. Which is a weird thing to do, to invoke a being that we don't know much about. It's like inviting a very powerful stranger into your home. Hmm. Despite what appears to be a possible Gnostic tagline and the invocation of the Akephalos with some Egyptian associations, the text first named Invoker is none other than it's Moses, your prophet Moses, to whom you have transmitted your mysteries as celebrated by Israel. Here, weirdly misspelled as Israel in the Greek, but like I said, this is a, this text is no showcase of ancient scribal arts. Again, while we're syncretizing, there's a Cairo monogram with the Christian language actually added to it of paraclete language or helper language actually added right there at the very beginning of the text, maybe added by a later interpolator in the margin just as the stele begins. It's not reproduced in the bets, but I put it on the screen. Now this combination of language, imagery, and religious syncretism might strike us, modern readers, as exceptional, Osiris and Moses in the same text, but at least in the world of the P Greek magical papyri, this is really just the rule and not the exception. Following the introduction of Moses, the text also introduces a possible pharaonic name, again with associations with Osiris, before mentioning again that this wisdom was actually transferred to the prophets of Israel. One can only imagine both Orthodox, Israelite, and Egyptian religious leaders rolling in their graves with this one, which is fantastic. Following this initial invocation of the Akephalos, the exorcistic section of the spell begins by revealing the true name of that deity, perhaps with an empty spirit. This is a series of nomina barbara, or untranslated magical words. Though that language of empty spirit is also connected in a spell associated with the Egyptian Set, the evil entity in the Demotic Leiden Papyri PDM 675 and following, where there is an invocation there for casting evil sleep, maybe catalepsy, on someone and involves, among other horrifying things, placing the decapitated head of a donkey between one's feet. You can compare that with the Akephalos ritual, where he declares, I am the headless daimon with sight in my feet but also simply invoking similarly the empty air, which is also terrible and invisible, both in this seeming invocation associated with Set, but also with the Akephalos deity. Though, ironically enough, one spell seems to be casting out diamonds, the one in question, and the other is actually invoking Typhonian Seth to inflict harm, again showing the wide, even contradictory range of these invocations of the Greek magical papyri. Now, as for those nomina barbara, let me just say that I want to caution untranslatable magical words here, and this is honestly one of the weaknesses of the apparatus used by Betts in the standard edition of the Greek magical papyri that 
we all have. At least some of the Nomina Barbara are well-known divine names, such as Sabaoth, Yao, Gaia, Adonai, Abraxas, and others. Others may well be just transliterated Hebrew in some state of corruption. Note the phrase at the end of line 131, Basum Isak Sabaot Yao. It might just be the Hebrew Bashem Yitzchak Yahweh Sabaot, or in the name of Isaac Yahweh of the angelic army. But Betz's apparatus doesn't distinguish between such known or even strongly speculated etiologies of some of these Nomina Barbara and the other truly unknown meaningless, or at least not meaningless in the common sense, purposely enigmatic names, such as those wonderfully long palindromes the Greek magical papyri often revel in. Regardless, sorry for the editorializing, but this section follows typical exorcistic language, imploring the daimon to leave someone, seemingly not the speaker, but it also could be an auto-exorcism, by both beseeching and extolling the power of the akephalos, and alternating with various magical nomina barbara. Then the text dramatically shifts to what I call the divinity identity section, where the ritual practitioner is no longer invoking a kephalos as an exterior being to them to purge away some of these daimons from someone, but rather the speaker identifies with the divine being itself. Indeed, this section features some of the truly dramatic language and imagery, such as my name is a heart encircled with a serpent. In fact, the language of this section actually echoes some of the more technical language found at Corpus Semeticum 117 involving the creation of human beings. The final section includes the more practical matters of how to conduct the spell, specifically the construction of a papyrus headband with the true name of the Akafalos and instructions for reading the names facing north, the typical direction, I think, for a lot of Egyptian magic. And finally, as a kind of an appendix appended to the spell, is a seemingly additional spell, uh, which apparently binds various elemental daimons to the exorcist, although notably the element of fire is missing there. Crowley is going to come along and fix that in a few millennia, so don't, don't worry, along with a simple magic sign to be employed in the work, perhaps also to be written on the headband. This magic sign is among the most demure, really, in the Greek magical papyri. is simply two vertical dots followed by a seven-shaped design, positively simple compared to other texts and other magical signs that populate the Greek magical papyri. All in all, the Steli of Jew, the hieroglyphist in his letter, is an interesting, though by no means extraordinary, text in the vast collection that has come down to us. In many ways, it's honestly pretty typical in some ways, the mysterious headless god business accepted, and similarly powerful invocations also dot the magical landscape of the Greek magical papyri. The so-called Mithras liturgy found at PGM 4, 475 in the Great Paris Magical Text spring to mind as a truly astounding text of ritual power. But it isn't the text of the Steli of Jew as part of the vast collection of the Greek magical papyri that makes it so celebrated. It's the afterlife of the ritual, the rebirth of the steli as a text invoking the akephalos, not merely as the headless one, but as the bornless one in the ritual innovation of contemporary occultism, especially led by Aleister Crowley. As I mentioned toward the beginning of the episode, the steli would first receive a modern English edition in Charles Wycliffe Goodwin's 1852 Fragments of a Greco-Egyptian Work Upon Magic, before being popularly republished in the famed Egyptologist's work, E. A. Wallace Budge's 1899 volume on Egyptian magic. This is when all things Egyptian were all the rage at the time, the great days of mass cultural looting that we now call Egyptomania. Indeed, this Egyptomania made a significant, massive impact on the ritual aesthetics of late 19th century and early 20th century occultism. I mean, I mean, they literally dressed up like pharaohs and stuff. The incorporation of the steli being one such example. Exactly how the text entered into the occult circle of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn is, isn't exactly clear, unsurprisingly. It's possible that Alan Bennett introduced the text to Aleister Crowley. They shared a flat in London around the time that the Budge text came out and around the time that it would have been percolating and ended up into the Goetia. 
who would then, of course, go on to append the text to Mather's edition of the Lesser Key of Solomon as the preliminary invocation, the invocation of the heart gird with a serpent, or the bornless ritual. Of course, two things might jump out to us at this point about this title. The first is just to wonder what a 4th century Greek invocatory ex exorcistic text has to do with an early modern text for summoning demons. The combination seems not a little... It seems pretty ironic. But also, the introduction of the phrase bornless ritual for the text. Where did the phrase bornless ritual come from? It seems the latter informs the earlier oddity in this case. Mathers or Crowley, or someone in that magical circle, hit upon an interesting riff considering the nature of the Akaphalos deity. They took to understanding a Kephalos, with the Greek term for head akin to the Hebrew term Hosh, which can mean beginning, as in Hosh Hashanah, literally the head of the year. Thus, by extension and squinting and looking at it sideways, one can understand a Kephalos as not beginning or not born, thus eternal. This creative rereading thus opens a door to the text as the invocation to the bornless one. Though, to be honest, I don't think this hoop jumping is justifiable from the steli itself, or even intertextually in the PGM, or in the Hebrew for that matter. The word to be born in Hebrew is lahivaled, which has nothing to do with the word hosh, head, nor any connection in Greek, but I guess creativity is called creativity for a reason. Though, as Marco Visconti pointed out to me in private correspondence while I was preparing this episode, this meaning would be also interestingly extended to the process of ego loss or ego destruction, i.e. the head, to make way for the communion with one holy guardian angel. And more on that, of course, in a moment. Also, already in this edition, the ritual is starting to float away from the original Greek text. The so-called nomina barbara are drifting significantly from their original form. They are apparently understood as various names of the bornless one or other deities. Crowley has introduced rushing fire into the final exorcism to even out the three elements that are found there to the more proper four, as much as there are four elements along with the final directions and the beneficent sign removed and replaced with Yao Sabao, such are the words, to conclude the ritual. Clearly the steli of the PGM is undergoing as much transformation as it's undergoing rebirth. The text in roughly this form would be fixed as the central ritual in the developing religious practice of Crowley. In fact, it would prove a positive watershed in the development of his religion, Thelema. In the first instance, the ritual was actually invoked in the Great Pyramid by Crowley in 1903, and he would use it to attempt to summon some sylphs for his wife Rose in 1904. Now, why she never saw any of the sylphs, she did seem to undergo a profound alteration of consciousness, claiming they are waiting for you. And as the nights went on and the invocation was repeated, went on to finally declaring, he who waits is Horus. Crowley would actually take her to the Cairo Museum to test her, and she would eventually point at the famed stele of Revealing, thus revealing the foundational text of Thelema, the Book of the Law. Two years later, Crowley, while crossing China, would employ the same ritual to complete the Abramelin ritual that he'd begun back in Beleskin to gain knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. Perhaps, along with crossing the abyss, the two truly outstanding religious goals of Thelema. Here, the ancient syncretism of the Greek magical papyri meets the 17th century Goetia, only to loop back to a quasi-Jewish medieval magical text, a marriage of syncretisms across millennia and continents. However, it would be in connection to gaining knowledge and conversation of one's holy guardian angel that the bornless ritual would settle into its mature form as Liber Samach in contemporary occultism. At the Abbey of Thelema at Cefalu in Sicily, Crowley would further develop the ritual along with providing elaborate commentary on it for his student, the Australian Frank Bennett, with the final form taking shape on August the 30th, 1921. Oddly, the text refers to itself as the Gospel, the core text having undergone significant change, 
with Crowley inserting his own magical name where seemingly appropriate, but also dramatically explaining the nomina Barbara, now well removed from their original Greek, thus rendering them epistemologically and Kabbalistically explained. Now, these explanations are often downright perplexing until the letters and syllables are kind of broken apart and then indexed to text of correspondences, specifically texts like Libra 777, where the Sphirot, the Tarot, I Ching, Chakras, etc. are all set into an elaborate interconnected system that we now call the Hermetic Kabbalah, Kabbalah with a Q. Of course, this does distort the text even further from the original, sometimes with Crowley not realizing that some of the Greek words are just normal Greek words and others perhaps are translated or corrupt Hebrew. And he just often interpolates beings from the Book of the Law back into the Nomina Barbara of the text. But again, creative is as creative does. Crowley has just as much right to trust his sense of Atatis to develop religious text as much as any would-be prophet. However, and to that point, the part of the text that really proves utterly impressive to me are the commentaries in the text reflecting Crowley's on years long at that point experience with the text both liturgically but also phenomenologically. The liturgical sections are deeply interesting in the development of this in ancient incantation. And to that end, Liber Samech is a true de tour de force of the phenomenology of mystical experience in a purely contemporary ceremonial magical context. Frankly, one simply has to read it to appreciate it, and there's no amount of summarizing I could do that would impress upon you just how impressive it is. Indeed, in the commentaries that follow, Crowley provides some of the most lush, but also some of his most analytic discussions of the liturgical motions on the astral plane of the ritual itself, but also the metaphysical dynamism of the self itself, its dissolution, reconstitution, the spiritual ardor of aspiration, the alluring and repelling of one's holy guardian angel, the moment and continuance of knowledge and conversation, but also, I think critically important, the continued need to move beyond the mere ecstatic joy of that communion with the HGA to deeply analytic lessons from that contact, but also concrete actions that follow from the experience itself. It's an initiation, not an end goal. In this way, the text is a profound insight into the very phenomenology of contemporary mysticism under the very specific aegis of Thelema and a text worthy of study for, frankly, any student of religion. It's thus no wonder that Liber Samech is rightly regarded as a classic in contemporary occult literature, but also, if not, the central ritual in Thelema, despite the fact that Crowley warned his students that simply aping the ritual for their own radically personal knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel wasn't exactly advisable. Regardless, I suppose one has to start somewhere, if one is going to start somewhere, and Liber Samech seems surely to be a place of extreme power and inspiration to at least begin such a journey. The Steli of Jehu, the hieroglyphist in his letter, has enjoyed a rather interesting ride over the last 1500 or so years. Part of a group of rituals invoking the mysterious and powerful Akephalos lost for a thousand years, and then reintroduced into ritual practice and becoming the centerpiece of a holy magical religion of Thelema by Aleister Crowley, though it's now employed variously by occult practitioners from left-hand path folks as a ritual of Typhonian set, and by contemporary hermeticists as a means to banish foul daimons from their soul and their ascent back to the Gwen and the good. This ancient and powerful ritual has proven itself a profound well for ritual discovery and academic analysis. It's worthy, actually, to track the text through its various editions through recent history, starting all the way back with Charles Wyckoff Goodwin's 1852 fragment of a Greco-Egyptian work upon magic. You can find that text over at archive.org and note that many of the nomina barbara are just sort of dot dot dotted away. From there, you can track the text to its appearance in a single page of Budge's Egyptian magic in the late 19th century before it appears in Mathers and Crowley's Lesser Key of Solomon. From there, I'd probably turn to the standard Betts edition, and you can look at that in the Greek Magical Papyri, before eventually turning back to the Libra Samech itself, which can be found in Crowley's monumental Book 4 and Appendix 4. 
The new edition of Book 4 by Skinner has some rather snarky notes, to be honest, in the text, which can come across as, let's call it, impatient with Crowley's flair for ritual innovation, but they are admittedly helpful for the student comparing the historical text with the Liber Samach edition, so there's that. It's also an important corrective to the famed Blue Brick edition, which actually doesn't even mention this text derives itself from a Greek magical papyrus text, if I recall correctly. Again, I really want to express my appreciation to Marco Visconti for looking over this episode, and until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.